Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you in the back, or if you are a newcomer and you enjoy what you're hearing, please take just a second and hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell to set it to all. It really does help me and the channel. Also, if you like what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee, or if you would like to know how to become a member of Back to Ashes, that information can be found down in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crime Cases Volume 14. There will be an ad after this intro. There will be a second ad before I read the first case, and after that there will be no more ads within the video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Caution, some of these cases may not be suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. Womb Raider Killer How Lisa Montgomery Cut Bobby Joe Stennett's Baby From Her Womb in a small town, a most gruesome crime occurred that still haunts the community in Skidmore, Missouri. With only 245 residents, national media descended on the normally quiet town after a local mother was found dead, her baby cut from her womb. What happened to Bobby Joe? On December 16, 2004, Becky Harper, mother of Bobby Joe Stennett, 23, made a distress call to 911 approximately at 3.30 p.m. Harper told the dispatcher that her daughter, who was eight months pregnant, was lying on the floor and that it looked like her stomach had exploded. When paramedics arrived at the scene, they found Bobby Joe dead with what was described by Nodaway County Sheriff Randy Strong as a jagged gash across her abdomen that exposed some of her internal organs. Bobby Joe's baby had been forcibly removed from her abdomen. Paramedics did everything they could to revive Bobby Joe, but she was pronounced dead at St. Francis Hospital in Maryville. The investigation. Authorities found no forced entry, indicating that Bobby Joe might have known the perpetrator. Investigators put out an Amber Alert for the baby, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, and State Highway Patrol joined the search. As investigators searched the neighborhood, they came upon one witness who said they saw a red, subcompact car parked outside of Bobby Joe's home. They stated they had never seen the car before. Investigators interrogated Bobby Joe's husband, Zeb Stinnett, who was distraught. They had been high school sweethearts. He claimed he had left at 7 a.m. for work at a manufacturing plant. Authorities checked out his alibi and immediately cleared him as a suspect in the case. Bobby Joe had raised rat terriers at her home. Her mother had talked to her at 2.30 p.m. on the day of the murder. Bobby Joe had exchanged emails with a woman from Fairfax, Missouri, about 20 miles from Bobby Joe's house, and she also expected a woman to come by to buy one of the dogs that she raised. Investigators were unable to determine that the murder occurred between 2.30 and 3.30 p.m. that day. Detective Sergeant Curtis Howard of the Electronic Crimes Unit at St. Joseph's Police Department conducted a forensic search. He discovered that the woman had identified herself as Darlene Fisher. Further investigation was conducted to learn more about the woman. Cause of Death Autopsy reports indicated that Bobby Joe had been strangled. However, her cause of death was determined to be exogenation, meaning she bled out from a crudely performed C-section. Blood between Bobby Joe's toes determined she stood in one place while she was attacked. Detectives believed she was unconscious after being strangled, but woke up when the knife had sunk into her abdomen. Why? According to forensic psychologist Dr. Tate Termini, quote, 
There are multiple reasons why someone would want to steal a baby in such a grotesque manner. One reason is to sell the child on the black market. On December 17th, a woman called in a tip and pointed to Lisa Montgomery, whom she had met at a dog show. Montgomery also raised rat terriers like Bobby Joe. The woman who called said Lisa Montgomery had given birth to a child the same day Bobby Joe was murdered. Authorities determined Montgomery lived in Melbourne, Kansas, about 170 miles from Bobby Joe. A forensic analysis of Bobby Joe's computer revealed that the IP address for the Darlene Fisher messages had been emailed from the computer of Lisa's husband, Kevin Montgomery. FBI agents found the red car parked at the Montgomery's home, the same one parked outside Bobby Joe's home the day before. Investigators from Skidmore arrived shortly after and conducted a surveillance at the home. Around 1 p.m., Montgomery arrived home with a baby. Investigators told Kevin Montgomery they were looking into all recent births due to an Amber Alert. While inside, they saw Lisa Montgomery sitting on the couch holding the baby, observing that the baby was breathing. Investigators did not want to scare Montgomery, so she might harm the baby. Montgomery said she had given birth the previous day at a birth center in Topeka, Kansas, but she did not have any paperwork reflecting a discharge. Detectives called the birth center and confirmed there had been no babies born there on December 16th. One detective asked Montgomery if they could hold the baby while they continued talking. Shockingly, she agreed. Authorities separated the couple, and then Montgomery told them she had given birth at home with the aid of three friends. When investigators asked for their names, she changed her story once again. Eventually, they psychologically broke Montgomery down, and she admitted that she had been in Bobby Joe's home the day before. Police determined that Montgomery's husband had been unaware of her activity. She had convinced him she was pregnant and expecting a baby. Quote, she had to know there was a huge risk that Bobby Joe would die. Former NYC prosecutor Beth Karras told Oxygen. Inside the car, authorities found a note with Bobby Joe's address, a rope knotted with air, and a bloody knife. A forensic search of Montgomery's computer showed that she had monitored Bobby Joe's pregnancy by pictures. She had also researched performing C-sections. Bobby Joe and Montgomery had crossed paths while attending a dog shows and breeding their rat terriers. They also interacted on an online chat room devoted to the breed called Ratter Chatter. Montgomery told Bobby Joe she was pregnant, so the women chatted online about their pregnancies. The Trial Montgomery was charged with kidnapping resulting in death, a charge established by the Federal Kidnapping Act in 1932. If convicted, she faced the death penalty. At a pretrial hearing, a neuropsychologist testified that head injuries occurring years before may have damaged the part of the brain that controls violent behavior. Her trial started on October 2, 2007. Her defense declared Montgomery did not understand her actions due to severe child abuse as a child. Her trial attorney also said Montgomery suffered from pseudodiesis, a mental condition that causes a woman to believe she is pregnant and show signs of pregnancy. In addition, they claimed that she had post-traumatic stress disorder and borderline personality disorder. Regardless, the jury returned with a guilty verdict on October 22, 2007. Shortly after midnight on January 13, 2021, Lisa Montgomery was executed by lethal injection at the United States Penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana, becoming the first woman executed by the federal government since 1953 and fourth overall. Who was this monster? Lisa Marie Montgomery was born February 27, 1968, and resided in Melvering, Kansas, when the murder occurred. 
Montgomery was born with fetal alcohol syndrome and had permanent brain damage. She was raised in a home where she was physically, emotionally, and sexually abused. She was allegedly beaten and raped by her stepfather and his friends beginning at the age of 11. Montgomery sought to mentally escape by drinking alcohol. When her mother discovered Lisa's alcohol use at the age of 14, she threatened her with a gun. Montgomery married at age 18, but her first two marriages were also abusive. Montgomery had four children. She underwent a tubal ligation in 1990, and after that, pretended to be pregnant several times, according to her first two husbands. The defense tried to pull the sympathy card by revealing Montgomery's past during the trial. Maybe there has been some justice, but nothing can bring back the loving mother the community and her family miss. Megan Morrow, a childhood friend of Bobby Joe, told the Maryville Forum, quote, I think the only thing I can say now is that I hope this horrific ordeal is over and memories can now be the focus for her family and not have constant reminders of the perp that took such a beautiful person from this earth. Remembering Bobby Joe. When someone is murdered, it is crucial to the victim's families that they are remembered and talked about. Bobby Joe certainly deserves that. She is remembered as a friendly young lady who lifted others with her positive attitude. Bobby Joe was born on December 4th of 1981 and graduated from Nottoway Holt High School in Graham, Missouri in 2000. In addition to raising dogs, she worked at the Kawakaski plant in nearby Maryville. Bobby Joe was buried at Hillcrest Cemetery in Skid Row, Nottoway County, Missouri. Her headstone reads, Beloved Wife and Mother of Victoria. Bobby Joe's daughter, Victoria Joe, was returned to her father. Zeb, in the aftermath of the murder, is now a young adult. She has not yet spoken publicly about her mother's murder. Her birthday falls on the anniversary of her mother's death. Brian Cohey, the horrific murderer of Warren Barnes. A horrific crime. On the night of February 27, 2021, Warren Barnes, a homeless man living outside of downtown businesses in Grand Junction, Colorado, was asleep under a bridge. Despite being homeless, Barnes was a popular figure among the downtown community for his amiable disposition and his love of reading. But what would happen next shocked and terrified the entire community. Brian Cohey, 19 years old at the time, had been plotting to murder someone for the past six months. His preference was a homeless person or a prostitute, believing there would be few people that would miss his victim. That day, Brian Cohey had been passing through the area when he spotted a 69-year-old Warren Barnes sleeping. Brian Cohey would approach Barnes with a kitchen knife, a mask, and three layers of gloves on, and proceeded to horrifically murder him. Cohey had seen Barnes laying under a canvas upon arriving. He walked up to Barnes with knife in hand, pulled back the canvas, and stabbed him in the neck. I've always wondered what murder felt like. Brian Cohey discussing the murders to a detective. Burns did not die after the first stab, however, and would wake up and scream out of pain. Cohey then got on top of Barnes and continuously stabbed him until ultimately killing him. During this time, Barnes's head would also be partially decapitated. Cohey would further mutilate the body slicing open Barnes's stomach to see his guts, as he admitted to police in an interrogation, and also cut off Barnes's hands and placed them in a plastic bag. Cohey also stabbed Barnes in the eyes. But his horrendous acts did not stop there. Cohey would then cut apart Barnes's right arm at the joints and partially dismembered the left one. He would also cut a joker smile into Barnes's face before finally decapitating the head 
and placing it in a leftover pizza box, leaving the rest of Barnes' body at the scene. Kohi arrived home and washed his hands. He stored the dismembered head and hands of Barnes in trash bags in his closet. Kohi would then lay in his bed and try to sleep, but would become worried that he may be discovered by a potential hole in his gloves. So Kohi put on a different outfit and drove back to Barnes' body, where he would place it in his trunk. Then he drove to the Blue Heron River. Kohi dumped Barnes' body into the water, but when trying to leave, Kohi's car would slide into the river and become stuck. The police department would be called out to the car to discover Kohi, but he was released from the scene without suspicion. Kohi would return home, hoping that his crimes would go unnoticed. A terrifying discovery. On March 1, 2021, Kohi's parents would make the terrifying discovery. Terry Kohi, Brian's mother, would go into his bedroom, suspicious of his car sinking in the river the day prior. Upon entering his closet, Terry would discover a human head in a trash bag. Terrified, Terry would call 911, sending officers to the residence. Police would arrive and, with permission, enter the house and discover the head in the sink, where Terry had put it. Brian would be taken to a police interrogation room to be investigated, and it is here that Brian begins to happily talk to the detectives about his crimes. During the interview with the police, Brian would admit to the murder, telling them of how he had been planning it for a long time. Additionally, Kohi stated that he was in a negative mental state and claimed to have various mental disorders. Brian appeared to show little to no remorse for the crimes he committed and gladly told police of the details of his murder. Kohi would even use markers to map out the place of the crime and potential locations of the other parts of Barnes's body. Kohi would be arrested for his crimes. I thought it would be the best feeling in the world. Brian Kohi to a detective regarding how he believed committing murder would feel. The Trial The trial of Brian Kohi began in January of 2023, where Kohi would plead not guilty by insanity. The prosecution argued that during the interrogations, Kohi had confessed to the murders, and state psychologists determined that Kohi was not insane when the crime was committed. But defense attorneys said that Kohi's mental health disorder, such as major depressive disorder and autism, were triggered upon seeing Barnes and that he was insane during the murder. The trial would last 12 days. After a two-day jury deliberation, they found Brian Kohi guilty of first-degree murder tampering with a deceased human body, and tampering with evidence. Mike Williams, Alligators Blamed in Murder of Florida Duck Hunter What happened to Mike Williams? It was a frigid morning on December 16, 2000, in Tallahassee, Florida. Mike Williams left his home at around 3 a.m. to travel to Lake Seminole, about an hour away. It was duck season, and he wanted to be on the water before dawn to get his spot at first light. Mike told his mother, Cheryl Williams, that Lake Seminole had always been an extraordinary place for him. By late afternoon, Mike's wife, Denise Williams, began calling around and asking if anyone had heard from or seen him. He failed to return home after the trip as promised, as it was his marriage anniversary. She called her father and a friend named Brian Winchester to look around the lake. The Search Denise's father and Brian Winchester found Mike's truck parked along the shoreline at a remote boat ramp. Nothing appeared to be amiss, but Mike was nowhere to be found. Williams' brother, Nick, and dozens of friends went to the lake to search. They were joined by officials from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, along with two helicopters and airboats. Late that night, 
Mike's best friend Brian Winchester found his boat. His gas tank was still full, and Mike's duck decoys had never been used, meaning he could not have been on the water for long. Officials searched for days and turned up nothing. On day 10 of the search, a searcher found what looked like Mike's hat floating in the water. They searched for an additional 56 days and could not find his body. It would not be hard to drown in Lake Seminole by hitting a tree stump. Officials and even experienced hunters speculated he drowned and addressed the terrifying possibility that Mike was also eaten by many alligators there. However, that theory was erased due to the weather. A cold snap brought the temperatures down to the 20s the night he vanished. Fish and Wildlife Officer Alton Renew said alligators' metabolism decreases and they don't eat when it's that cold. They hibernate for the winter. Six months later, something else surfaced. His hunting jacket with his hunting license inside and high waders were found. The clothing had no tears or bite marks, so an alligator attack was ruled out. Meanwhile, Denise had filed to have Mike declared legally dead. A Leon County judge granted Denise's petition based on the recovered items and the assumption that alligators and other wildlife had eaten him in his entirety. The court decision permitted Denise to put a claim on her missing husband's life policy, for which she received one and a half million dollars. Mike's Early Life Jerry Michael Mike Williams grew up in Bradfordville, Florida, north of Tallahassee. His mother was a daycare provider, and his father was a Greyhound bus driver. They raised Mike and his older brother Nick in a double-wide trailer. They opted not to build a house and save their money so their children could attend the private North Florida Christian High School. Mike was an exceptional student who was active in the key club and served as a student council president. He also played football. Mike was a child who was always in a hurry, his mother told Cold Case Files. He never walked, he just ran. At age 15, Mike began duck hunting. It was around that time he started seeing a fellow student named Denise Morell. After attending North Florida Christian, Mike attended Florida State University, majoring in political science and urban planting. Before he graduated, he was hired by Ketchum Appraisal Group as a property appraiser. According to the group's owner, Mike was the hardest working person he knew. Mike married Denise in 1984. Their daughter was born in 1999. Mike was a dedicated father who often came home from work to eat dinner then returned to work as a real estate appraiser after his wife and daughter went to bed. According to his mother, Mike was making $200,000 a year and bought a home in a stylish subdivision on the east side of Tallahassee. Mike was a good, honest person, Cheryl told AE. He always worked for everything he got. Mike's father died in the mid-2000s shortly after Mike and Denise bought a $1.7 million life insurance policy through his friend Brian Winchester. Brian was a childhood acquaintance of Mike and Denise and Mike's best friend. Two days before Mike vanished, he and Denise told his brother Nick and Mike's mother that they plan on having another child soon. Denise also said they planned to cruise to Hawaii that week. Mike also planned on traveling to Jamaica for work. There was no reason why Mike would ever walk away from his life. Rumors and Development Investigators felt the facts in Mike's disappearance were inconsistent with the alligator theory, but regardless, the case went cold. There was one person who was not satisfied with this search, his mother. Cheryl believed her son might still be alive, but she wanted police to investigate. She suggested help from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in 2004, who finally agreed that they would initiate an investigation. By then, in 2005, rumors began to swirl. Denise had received her share of the life insurance policy and married Brian Winchester. 
who had divorced his wife a few years earlier. They even remained residing in Mike's house. After the wedding, FDLE investigators began focusing on Denise in Winchester. Cheryl Williams told officials that Denise threatened that she could no longer visit her granddaughter if she continues to pursue the investigation. When Cheryl told Denise, I couldn't stop this investigation if I wanted to, Denise kept her promise and no longer let Cheryl see her granddaughter, Onsley. Closed Case By 2006, investigators no longer returned Cheryl's calls, and she became agitated. In early 2007, FDLE closed the case. They were convinced the alligator story was not true, but they had no leads or evidence in the case that would allow them to continue investigating. However, a new lead was developed in October of 2007. Michael's older brother found a photograph and serial number for a Ruger 22 caliber pistol that had once belonged to their father. Michael had inherited it from his father's death, and it was the only firearm not returned to former in-laws by Denise when Michael was declared deceased. Agents from the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms, or the ATF, visited Denise and Winchester's house to interview them. Several days later, their attorney brought the gun to FDLE, and it was sent to the state forensics lab for DNA testing. The couple have never been vocal in the case, even though Brian Winchester was Michael's best friend. However, on the anniversary of Mike's death that year, the Winchesters made a public statement. For seven years, we have prayed and hoped to find out what happened to Mike, Brian said in an email to the Tallahassee Democrat. Nobody wants Mike found more than we do. Lobbying efforts. Cheryl would not be dissuaded from continuing the search for her son despite the FDLE investigation coming to another close. She became frustrated with FDLE, believing they were incompetent and lacking interest in solving the case. On New Year's Day in 2012, Cheryl began writing one letter per day to Governor Rick Scott requesting another agency to investigate or assign a special prosecutor. She wrote over 200 letters without acknowledgement and began to inquire why. It turned out that the governor's office had forwarded the unopened letters to FDLE, where they were placed in a case file. Cheryl was distraught. They could not have hurt me more if they punched me in the face, she told the Tallahassee Democrat break in the case. In 2012, Denise and Brian separated, supposedly because of his sex addiction. She filed for divorce in 2015. In August of 2016, Winchester abducted Denise at gunpoint. Investigators thought Winchester was going to kill her to stop from telling officials what she knew about Mike's disappearance. This was the break authorities had been waiting for. Winchester was arrested for kidnapping, domestic assault, and armed burglary, but his attorney was able to maneuver a deal for him. If he showed the police where he buried Mike's body and told them the truth about Mike's murder, they would only charge him for the abduction of Denise and not the murder of Mike. Winchester was sentenced to 20 years in prison for the kidnapping of Denise in December 2017. He is now serving his sentence at Madison Correctional Institute in Rayford, Florida. His release date is July 30th, 2036. Discovery of the Body Mike was not mentioned at Winchester's sentencing. However, State Attorney Jack Campbell told the media that he had hoped that Winchester case would somehow solve Mike's disappearance. It would be found out later that Winchester had reached an agreement with prosecutors before the sentencing that they would not pursue a life sentence on the kidnapping charge. Further agreement details between Winchester and the prosecutors have never been released. The following day, FDLE special agent in charge, Mark 
Perez announced Mike's body had been found and his death was determined to be a homicide. Afterward, the FDLE released that Mike's remains were found within five miles of where he grew up at a dead end on Gardner Road in northern Leon County. His DNA matched his mother's. FDLE discovered that they had received information about the location of a body in early October 2017. County Works employees utilized backhoes for what they were only told was an exercise. They dug for five 16-hour days in nine feet of mud at the corner of the lake. During the effort, they had to hold back the lake water by dams and pumps while working against water moccasins and eels. On October 18, 2017, search dogs and investigators found Mike's remains in mud with plywood stacked on top only five miles from his mother's home. According to the Tallahassee Democrat, 98% of his bones were located and remarkably preserved, including his clothing, winter gloves, and booties. Wife's Arrest On May 8, 2018, Denise Williams was arrested at Florida State University, where she was employed. She was arrested when she left work to celebrate her daughter's 19th birthday. Only hours before, the grand jury had indicted her on charges of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and accessory after the fact. Winchester had testified before a grand jury that he and Denise had planned to kill Mike for the insurance and that they had been lovers for three years before Mike was murdered. Two FDLE investigators went to notify Cheryl of the indictment. Two days later, the three-page indictment was released. In it, investigators believe that Denise began to conspire with Winchester in March of 2000 only nine months before Mike vanished. Winchester is alleged to have shot Mike with a gun. Denise's lawyer, Ethan Way, said Denise had nothing to do with Mike's murder and that Winchester acted on his own. Way entered a not guilty plea. The trial of Denise Williams. In late June, 2018, Denise was held without bond and her trial date was scheduled for September 24th. The court played audio of Winchester's interview. In the recording, he admitted to pulling the trigger of the gun, but that it had been Denise's idea. Her attorney argued that the tape should not be entered into evidence because, despite Winchester admitting he murdered Mike, he was not charged with anything. The court denied the motion. Winchester was the state's star witness against Denise and testified at length that he and Denise had never ended their high school relationship, even after they were both married. Denise made it clear she would never get divorced, primarily because of appearances, because she is ultra concerned of how she appears to the world, Mike told investigators. She wanted a scenario where it was an accident. Winchester described the dreadful detail how he pushed Mike from his boat, hoping his waders would sink him. When Mike resurfaced, he circled the boat around him several times. Then he shot Mike in the face with a shotgun, later burying his body in Leon County. I wanted to get something to hide the body, so I got a tarp and shovel, Winchester told the court. While it took nearly 18 years to get the real details behind Mike's disappearance, it only took a jury eight hours to find Denise guilty of first-degree murder, a life sentence with no possibility of parole. The prosecutors had proved Denise was the mastermind. On November 25, 2020, the court reversed her first-degree murder charge and the accompanying life sentence was reversed on appeal. However, the charge of con- However, the charge of conspiracy to murder remains active with a 30-year sentence. Denise is serving time at the Florida Women's Reception Center in Ocala, Florida, with a release date of October 17, 2046. A mother's dedication. Mike would not have been found without his mother's courage and grit. 
which kept his story alive for so many years. Cheryl refused to believe alligators had eaten her son in a duck hunting accident. Shortly after her son's disappearance, Cheryl visited Lake Seminole looking for hope. She told A&D, quote, I was standing on this little board out of the water and his voice came to me just as clear as a bell. And it said, Mike is not in Lake Seminole. You have to find him and bring him home soon. So I thought Michael was alive. She set out to find her son and would go on to any lengths. She put up billboards around town, placed newspaper ads, and even stood on the street corners with signs. I just did what any mother would do, Cheryl told the Tallahassee Democrat in 2020. If I had known he was dead, I wouldn't have even been able to do what I did. Cheryl sat in a classroom, listening to the gruesome details of how Michael was clinging to a stump in the water as his friend shot him in the face. The pain a mother feels losing a child is beyond comprehension, and Cheryl is no exception. Quote, She was a good person, a friend in the family, and now at night... When I go to sleep, the last thing I see is Michael clinging to a stump in the middle of the mud, screaming for help, and I wasn't there to help him, Cheryl told A&E in a taped interview. And it's what I have to live with. Cheryl also lives with the loss of her granddaughter, whom she has not seen since she was five years old and is now an adult. I would love to have my granddaughter in my life, and there are a million things I would like to tell her about her daddy, but the main thing I would like to tell her now is he loved her more than life itself. Robert Durst, real estate heir turned murderer a shroud of mystery. Interesting and elusive, Robert Durst, 1944 to 2022, evokes a sense of familiarity as if he could be anyone's grandfather or kindly rich uncle. Yet fortune did not smile upon those who could have been his descendants, for Durst had no biological children. Born into wealth, he trod lightly in his family's real estate empire, scarcely holding down a job. However, his notoriety did not stem from business triumphs, but from a cloud of suspicion surrounding multiple disappearances and murders. The Disappearance of Durst's First Wife Durst, the son of the wealthy and highly successful New York real estate developer Seymour Durst, entered into matrimony with Kathleen Kathy McCormick, a dental hygienist, in 1973. Their marriage encountered difficulties, and though they separated in 1980, they did not formally divorce. During this period, People magazine reported that Durst began dating Maya Faro's sister, Prudence, who famously inspired the Beatles song, Dear Prudence. Kathy was last seen alive on January 31st of 1982. Despite residing in separate apartments in Manhattan, they still maintained a shared cottage in Westchester County, New York, as detailed in a People article focusing on the life of Kathy. On the night of her disappearance, Kathy attended a party hosted by her friend Gilberte Najami in Newtown, Connecticut. However, she abruptly left after receiving an angry phone call from her estranged husband. In a 2001 interview with ABC News, Najami revealed that Kathy had visited her home, visibly distressed, engaging in phone calls with her estranged husband, who demanded she return home immediately. Najami recalled the chilling parting words of her friend as Kathy implored her friend to investigate if anything were to happen to her, experiencing fear of what Bobby Durst might do. 
Contradicting accounts emerged as Durst informed investigators that he and his wife had argued upon her return to their South Salem, New York cottage that evening. Durst claimed he then drove her to the train station before returning to Manhattan. Five days later, Durst contacted the police to report Kathy missing. People magazine detailed a doorman's account of seeing a woman resembling Kathy from behind on the day Durst claimed she returned to Manhattan. Additionally, the dean of the medical school where Kathy was studying stated he received a call from a woman claiming to be Kathy, reporting illness and the possibility of missing class. In 2000, Westchester County investigators reopened the investigation into Kathy Durst's disappearance, initially classified as a missing persons case rather than a murder. The following year, Kathy was declared dead despite the fact that nobody was found. Note, Durst was eventually charged with murder and the death of his first wife, nearly four decades after she disappeared just days after he was sentenced to life in prison in California for killing a confidant who helped him cover up the slaying. The Murder of Suzanne Berman Durst's close friend Susan Berman was found dead with a gunshot wound to her head in her Los Angeles home in December of 2000. Berman had allegedly helped Durst cover up the disappearance of his wife. Durst was suspected but not charged until months later. Evidence from the Jinx documentary, particularly the letter Durst sent to Berman with handwriting and misspellings matching those on a note sent to the police at the time of Berman's murder, played a crucial role in this case. As detailed in the 2001 New York Times article, Suzanne Berman's family and friends were initially not suspicious of Robert Durst and believed he would never harm her. The closeness of their relationship was evident when Durst had the honor of giving her away at her wedding in 1984. At that time, her bond appeared unbreakable, leaving those close to Susan Berman unsuspecting of any potential wrongdoing by Durst. A mobster's daughter. Berman had an interesting life with various notable achievements. She was a writer and journalist who authored several books, including Easy Street, The True Story of a Gangster's Daughter, 2002, which recounted her experiences growing up as the daughter of a notorious Las Vegas mobster. Berman also worked as a freelance journalist, contributing to various publications. Berman was born in Las Vegas, Nevada on February 18th of 1945. She was the daughter of David Davy Berman, a prominent figure in organized crime associated with the Flamingo Hotel and Casino and the Las Vegas underworld during the mid 20th century. Her mother, Gertrude Gert Berman, was a showgirl. Berman's mother was tragically murdered when Sean was just a teenager. The unsolved killing of her mother deeply affected Berman and played a significant role in her life. Berman and Durst became friends while attending graduate school at the University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA. They maintained a close relationship throughout the years, and Berman was believed to have helped Durst during his troubled times, including covering up the disappearance of his first wife. Tragically, Berman was murdered in her home in Benedict Canyon, Los Angeles, on December 24th of 2000. The investigation into her death remained unsolved for many years until new evidence emerged. In 2015, Durst was arrested in New Orleans by the FBI on a murder warrant issued by a Los Angeles judge related to Berman's death. After a protracted legal battle in 2001, Durst was convicted of Berman's murder. Durst's actions and subsequent investigations have stirred significant interest in true crime communities and have contributed to an ongoing debate about wealth, power, and justice in the United States. Morris Black's Death 
In 2001, while Durst was living in Galveston, Texas, under an assumed identity, he was charged with the murder of his neighbor, Morris Black. Black resided in the same apartment complex as Durst in Galveston. They lived in separate units, but their paths crossed as neighbors. Despite their proximity, the nature of their relationship remains somewhat unclear. Durst admitted to dismembering Black's body and dumping it in the Galveston Bay, but claimed that he killed Black in self-defense. In 2003, he was acquitted of murder and was convicted of tampering with evidence and jumping bail. Durst lived as a cross-dressing mute woman. While living next door to Black, Durst assumed a false identity using a woman's name. He posed as a mute woman named Dorothy Siner and presented himself as such to his neighbors, including Black. Durst's decision to live under a different identity added on additional layers of complexity and intrigue to the already peculiar circumstances surrounding his association with Black. HBO, which is now being called Max, by the way, documentary. In the HBO documentary series, The Jinx, The Life and Deaths of Robert Durst, made a shocking and infamous statement. During the series finale episode, while in the bathroom but unaware that his microphone was still recording, Durst muttered to himself, What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. This chilling statement had been widely discussed and analyzed concerning Durst's suspected involvement in the disappearances and murders of various individuals throughout his life. You can watch his documentary on HBO, The Demise of Robert Durst. Durst met a tragic end as a prisoner in Stockton, California at the age of 78. Confirming his demise, Durst's lawyer, Chip Lewis, stated that he passed away at San Joaquin General Hospital while undergoing testing. Durst went into cardiac arrest and could not be revived. Before his death, he had been serving a life sentence at Berman's murder at the California Health Care Facility in Stockton. Described by Wikipedia as a state prison for incarcerated patients with long-term medical needs or acute medical health needs. Durst's conviction of Berman's murder came in September, and shortly after, he tested positive for COVID-19, requiring a brief period on a ventilator. According to his attorney, the virus exacerbated Durst's pre-existing medical conditions leading to a deterioration in his health and ultimately his death. Durst was fascinating and evil. Despite his meager physical statue and slender frame, he was a cross-dressing fugitive, evading justice while harboring a substantial fortune of $100 million. During his time on the run, he adopted a vagabond lifestyle, engaging in public acts of indecency, such as urinating on public places. At times, he resorted to disguising himself as a mute woman. Disturbingly, he subjected his wife to domestic violence and allegedly coerced her into an abortion. The demise of Durst made the culmination of a life characterized by dark mysteries, shocking crimes, and a trail of unanswered questions that will forever remain etched in the annals of true crime history. And that, dear listeners, brings an end to these True Crime Cases, Volume 14. I would like to take a moment and give a very special shout-out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Neese, Denise S, Kwame Carter, Samantha McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. 
Thank you all so much for being a part of the Elite memberships, and also thank you so much for your support for Back to Ashes. For without you, there would not be a me or the channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed the selections. Until next time, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.